In 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. Roberts, amateur filmmaker, marketing entrepreneur, and an avid, lifelong world traveller. I wonder if you've heard the word or the term wanderlust. After the recent years of COVID, the natural disasters of bushfires, floods, the panic, doom and gloom scenarios of lockdowns over two years where we're all cooped up, unable to travel. I guess it's only natural to, to think that there would be a, a voice calling to me, a voice calling for a new adventure. And so it is. The plans are locked in and I'm very soon about to embark on a new global adventure. I'm gonna retrace the footsteps of Jules Fern's most famous character, Phileas Fogg, in his quest to go around the world in 80 days. And this time, I'm documenting it all for a new television series, where I'm going to be the, the writer, producer, presenter, and camera crew, which will see me spinning the globe once more. The book published in the late 1800s by Jules Verne set the Victorian era alight. It was a wild concept, employing the new technological advances of steam in locomotives. Jules Verne told a story about a Victorian character who bet his friends at the Reform Club that he could travel around the world in 80 days. As I said, traveling is not a new thing to me. I've been around the world many times. I had a successful career as a marketing entrepreneur in advertising and marketing. But that wasn't enough. I wanted to be traveling and I made sure that I traveled the globe every year. But this time it's different. I'm actually on my seventh passport. One of them was stolen by a group of street thugs on a Vaporetto in Venice. Another one I dropped down a crevasse while skiing down Europe's biggest mountain, Mont Blanc. But I've got all the other five, and I'm ready to go. One of my great regrets of all those trips, the only thing I really got was a few snaps here and there from very low budget or low tech cameras. But this time, that's all changing as I'm recording this adventure for a new travel TV series. Wish me luck. <laughs> the $64 question is, I guess, will I come back in one piece? I guess time will tell.
I'm here in a glorious morning on the very side skirts of the incredible Sydney Harbour. You may be asking yourself, what does Sydney Harbour and Sydney have to do with Phileas Fogg? Was it one of the places he went in his pilgrimage of around the world in 80 days? Well, no, it wasn't, but it's where I'm from. And this is where my journey starts, in my home city, Sydney, Australia. Sydney, capital of New South Wales. Founded in 1788, it's Australia's oldest city. With a population well into the third million, it's the largest too. 670 square miles of city. Now Sydney is something of a paradox. You could see how people from the Northern Hemisphere, like ye old England, for example, would look at Sydney and see it as this bright, shiny beacon, this shiny city perched at the end of the known universe. And to some extent, they'd be right. Geez, it's only 250 years old. Nothing compared to some of the old European cities. But it's also ancient. Each time we travel through, we would teach him it's not just a piece of rock or it's not just a dune, it has a meaning. We teach him about respecting the country. I'd like to honour the Gadigal people of the Eora Nations, the rightful historic owners and custodians of these lands and all of Australia, and all respect is offered to their ancestors and tribal elders. Sydney's population at the time of the 2021 census was 5,057,000. In 2021, 29% of Australia's population were born overseas. 7.5 million people resident in Australia in 2021 were born overseas and represent a multitude of different countries from around the world. People wax on and wax off to me about how diverse New York City or Los Angeles are, but Sydney beats both of them hands down in the diversity stakes. There are over 250 languages spoken in Sydney and around a third of residents speak a language other than English at home. Today, Sydney has an advanced market economy with strengths in finance, manufacturing and tourism. The gross domestic product was $337 billion US in 2013, higher than countries such as Denmark, Singapore and Hong Kong. And there's a significant concentration of foreign banks and multinational companies in Sydney. And the city is considered the main financial centre of the Asia Pacific region. But a reality check facing our leadership is that Sydney's four biggest contributing industries are mining, iron ore, China, fossil fuel products, gas and coal, China, tourism, China, and higher education, China. And our last leader, whose name shall remain blank, took it upon himself to start a fight with China that ruined 50 years of positive relations and turned our major trading partner into an enemy. Our new administration, courtesy of the election at the end of 2022, it's had a lot to try and repair. In addition to hosting events such as the 2000 Summer Olympics, millions of tourists come to Sydney each year to see the city's historic landmarks and take in the sites, including the Sydney Harbour, Royal National Park, Bondo Beach, the Royal Botanic Gardens, the Sydney Opera House, and the Harbour Bridge. Here we are at the Australian Museum in the First Nations exhibit. The early colonial history of Australia 
is shameful. It's horrendous. It started with a planned and systematic genocide of the traditional landowners, custodians, with the colonial wars, and continues virtually to this day. They were displaced, dispossessed. There was even a policy of taking their children away and rehoming them with white people. I don't think in the history of the world something so brutal and evil has there ever been manifest on a people. Captain James Cook first arrived in Australia on his ship, the Endeavour, in 1770. He declared the entire continent terra nullius, nobody's land, despite the fact that the First Nations people had been living here successively for over 50,000 years. And the doctrine has existed in the laws of nations throughout the development of the entire Western democracy. In fact, it's a Latin phrase which will give us a clue that it's derived from Roman law, the concept that ownership or seizure of a thing that no one owns is indeed legitimate. Our First Nations peoples have lived in Australia since time immemorial. Aboriginal people's homelands were taken by force. There was never any peaceful settlement. There were never any treaties. There was never any agreement. The lack of recognition of dispossession goes to the very heart of a wound in the nation. It's informed the political, social and economic systems in Australia, resulting in the racial inequity we see today. For First Peoples, it's not merely an opinion that Australia was invaded, it's a historical fact. Good old colonialism was theft. Not much to be proud of there. And there was definitely no pride in genocide. The genocide started in the violent early history of Australia's frontier wars, where armed forces attempted to exterminate as many First Nations people as they could find. Their order was killed on sight. They masqueraded it under the word disbursement. And despite not posing any real threat, the indigenous population back then were classified non-human. And they were deemed to have as much rights in the eyes of the law than kangaroos did. The mass exterminations were not the end of it. These were followed by dispossession, displacement, exploitation, and continuing ongoing violence that started at first contact, and later even included a government policy for the forced removal of children from their families, where white people took their children away. It's quite amazing to think what kind of damage that the white people have done to the indigenous First Nations people 
in just 250 years. Genocide displaced them, dispossessed them, broke them as a, as a, as a race. And it's no wonder they carry intergenerational trauma to this very day. And it's no wonder also that a lot of people call the 25th of January Invasion Day, because it was. That's for this day to be celebrated. You know, many Australians woke up today planning their barbecue with their fellow, fellow Australians. We all woke up with tears running down the line due to the generational trauma that continues that the government allows to celebrate such day that represents murder and genocide against another human being. We have feelings. We bleed red. Why do we get treated differently based off our skin colour? Because of the racist, corrupt system that was built against the First Nations people. What kind of emotions come up on a day like today for, for you? I, obviously it's mixed emotions, but the first thing I do is I think about food and cry. But I think about my grandmother, I think about my great-grandfather, I think about those that have gone, I think about my daughter, who is no longer with me at the moment. If she was here, she would be, you know, dancing with us today, as she always has done. So I kind of reflect on, on those that have gone, but then I reflect on the hope for the future. Because if you notice with our group, we have lots of young kids too, and, and I'm all about empowering our kids through culture and dance. That, and that, I feel, is our healing medicine. Now, many young Australians today would like us to sever our ties with Great Britain, the monarchy and all that stuff, and declare ourselves a republic, governing our own future destiny. But more importantly, to reconcile, acknowledge, and compensate the First Peoples fairly for their pain and suffering that our predecessors caused. In the worst cases, the people in power, the government, they refuse to acknowledge Indigenous Australians as human beings in order to justify or, I don't know, turn a blind eye to the, the incredible suffering and cruelty that were enacted upon them. Ironically, there's an exhibition here called Surviving Australia. And that's exactly what the First Nations people have been doing for the last 250 years. These 18th century colonial attitudes set in motion events and policies and established systems and institutions that continue to have an impact to this present day, despite all the efforts of Indigenous peoples trying to fight back against them. The social and economic impact of invasion and control of Indigenous people has accumulated across generations. It's not something that's going to be fixed overnight. And it's been devastating. It was amplified by the policies and practices that have systematically been put in place so the disadvantage we see today is often the long-term effect of the lack of opportunities in previous generations, including poor nutrition, inadequate education, inadequate health care, incarceration rates, deaths in custody, mental health effects have also been devastating. Now, whilst we can't change the crimes and atrocities committed in the past, what we can do is try and make a difference today. We can stand with our First Nation brothers and acknowledge their suffering, their injustices, the debt, reconcile, aid and compensate the First Peoples for all the pain and trauma that our predecessors caused. <laughs>
Sydney is the capital state of New South Wales, the most populous city and state in all of Australia and Oceania. It's located on the southeastern coast of the country, along the Tasman Sea, and around one of the largest, most spectacular natural harbours in the world. I'm here at the spectacular centre of Sydney, virtually. It's Secular Quay, where it all happens. You have the harbour, the ferries, the opera house, the bridge, and it's truly one of the world's greatest sights. Residents are known locally as Sydney siders, and along with rival Melbourne, makes up Australia's two most multicultural cities. First Nations peoples had inhabited the area for around 45,000 years. But then, surprisingly, the continent was discovered by a white English Captain Cook in 1770. And it took another 18 years before the first European settlement was created in 1788 with the arrival of the first fleet under Captain Arthur Phillip. 150 years ago, Captain Arthur Phillip hoisted the British flag on the shores of Sydney Cove and proclaimed the sovereignty of King George IV. Today, seven million Australians celebrate with pride and thanksgiving the mighty growth of the seed planted less than five generations ago. On the 13th of May, 1787, a fleet of 11 ships set sail from Portsmouth, England. On board were 759 convicts, most of them men, with sailors and marines to guard the prisoners. With them, they took seeds, farm implements, livestock such as cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, horses and chickens, and two years' supply of food. The first colonists came ashore right here at Port Jackson on the 26th of January, 1788. I'm here at the famous rocks, which would have to be one of the most unique areas in all of Australia and one of the oldest. It's actually a maritime village. It was the first maritime village ever in Australia and it, it was settled here just after Governor Phillip arrived in 1778. He didn't like Port Jackson so he explored up the harbour and actually found the, you know, the deep water spectacular now known as Sydney Harbour to form his settlement, which was right here on the waterfront at the rocks. And you can see this rocks area. It's the very first maritime village, the very first settled maritime village in all of Sydney. And it was right near the water's edge where Sydney basically sprang from. Now he had with him 11 ships. That was the flotilla that came out from Portsmouth and landed here in 1778. The journey took eight months. I can't imagine being on one of those old boats for eight months. And he, he had with him the company of 600 convicts. And they were largely victims or you know, convicted of petty crimes. And around the time, in the late 1700s, when this was all happening, England must have been a very peculiar place because the Industrial Revolution was in full swing and <clears throat> There was a big division in the class structure and if you didn't have money or, or part of the gentry, you were at the lowest of the low. And you were literally starving. So people would get hung. They, they used to love hanging people back in those days. They initially had transportation going to the Americas, but that finished and the Americans didn't want that anymore. So they, they stopped it in favor of a new trade that they had going, which was the importation of slaves. Now, reading up on the history of the slave transports, America could have had anything up to 50,000 slaves in one month land on their shores. So they saw a bigger future dividend in the trade of slaves than they did taking Britain's petty criminals. 1770, Cook landed in Australia declared it terra nullius and claimed it for England. And 18 years later, those 11 ships under Captain Phillip arrived in Jackson's Bay, carrying those 600 convicts. Now that was 100 years before Jules Verne's book, Around the World in 80 Days. It was around that time, must have been very shortly after 
1770 when Cook dis discovered um, Australia, that they looked at their options, the, the rules or the powers that be in Great Britain, and thought, hello, what about sending our criminal classes to this new place on the far end of the world? If, if America won't take them, we'll send them to this New Holland, which was eventually called Australia. So going back to the late 1700s, when this was all put in motion, I want to kind of, kind of picture what Great Britain would have been like back then. Obviously, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing, and the country must have been very under pressure to try and execute such a crazy plan of turning this new country into a prison island. There must have been a lot of problems in Great Britain around that time. And I can't imagine what it would have been like to be one of these petty criminals, to be found guilty of a crime, and to be not sentenced to the lash or the gallows, but to have your term commuted and put into a transportation sentence so that you would serve out your sentence in the new world. Like for starters, these poor souls, it must have been very close to being just as bad as a death sentence. For starters, these poor souls from impoverished backgrounds were put on these prison ships, these rickety old tall masted wooden ships in leg irons and chains and they were shackled. They wouldn't have had much to eat. And they had to endure an eight-month crossing of all the, the worst oceans in the world <laughs> through the worst seas. God, so many of them must have died. And who knows what they would have fed them on the, the ships. But obviously they, they wanted to try and keep them alive so they had a workforce when they got to the new world. That would have been absolute torture. But once the poor prisoners whose crimes could be as inconsequential as a loaf of bread being stolen, they were greeted by a land devoid of comfort and compassion. So once the poor prisoners whose crimes were as petty as stealing a loaf of bread to try and feed their family. Once they arrived, they were greeted by a land which was really kind of hostile, where everything really was trying to kill you. And they were immediately put to work on hard labour with the military overseers and watchers dealing them tough love. And there was a lot of the lash. Discipline in Australia was savage. Minor offences were punished by flogging more serious offences by hanging. The first person to be hanged in Australia was Thomas Barrett, who was executed on the 27th of February, 1788, for stealing food. The first woman to be hanged in Australia was Anne Davis, who was executed on the 23rd of November, 1789. And this brutal system, under the hands of the British governments, is said to have contributed to the lasting cultural mistrust of authority that we modern Australians still have. And also the Australian phenomenon of mateship, where common people share a bond to help their neighbours. So I guess the question is raised, to me at least, I wonder what their home life was like before they were carted off to the end of the world in these boats. Prevalent were child labour, child prostitution. And there was an addiction to various opioids, gin. An epidemic crime characterised the dark corners of pretty much all parts of, of London. Soho and Tottenham Road, for example. And a little bit further out, displaced country folk were mugging travellers along the various rural lanes of Devon and Cornwall. And these are all facts that were listed in historic papers, the gallows dominated their penal landscape. And many death sentences, as I said before, were, were per 
permuted or transmuted to transportation or forced exile for life. I guess they could have called it a number of different things back then, but either way you, you termed it, it was pretty bad. So since the Home Office and the Admiralty no longer had a definite place to transfer the criminals, i.e. America, the jails were overflowing with habitual and small-time petty criminals. Close to London, I guess it was on the Thames, they had these hulks, which were old sailing ships, disused naval vessels, moored in all the major ports of Britain, and they used those to fill them up with convicts. They were looking, they, they needed new places to actually park these people. The ships were served as tiny offshore penal settlements, but were not really offshore enough to satisfy the government. Now, probably the best historical work available exploring this whole subject is The Fatal Shore, a book published by Australian author and art critic Robert Hughes. It's a sweeping, eloquent, argumentative, compelling account of the settling of white Australia. It's a book that I, I purchased many years ago and found it a fascinating read. I don't know what happened to that book. The book took Hughes over a decade to research and write. He put his heart and soul into it. His book was apparently written as a response to a variety of Australian, what they call founding myths, all aimed at erasing the convict stain, as it was called. Going back in time, Australians had a really weird sort of paranoia about who they were and their identity. The largest difference between the nations of America and Australia back then, in the late 1700s, is that America, in America, the European Adam and Eves, they arrived by choice. The early pilgrims who came on the Mayflower were redeemed by their arrival and they tread as free peoples on a sanctified earth. In Australia, however, our equivalent of Adam and Eve, their choice of landfall had been made by the Home Secretary of Britain. They came involuntarily, Adam and Eve, and they came in leg irons. The life of the newly arrived convict was in many ways horrifying. Survival was often just a lottery. Even child convicts, child labour was in the, the colonies just like it was back in the home country. In the ruins of the Tasman Peninsula on the island of Van Diemen's Land, which is now called Tasmania, you can see thumbprints of the child felons of the sinisterly named Point Puer. A step up for the convict was assignment to a free settler. Early Sydney and Van Diemen's lands were entirely penal, but a slow infusion of free settlers began, an increasing number of convicts finished their sentences, acquired freedom, and settled on the spacious lands, sometimes becoming pastoralists. The former convicts were called emancipists, the free settlers exclusives. Even there, there was some sort of a class structure. The offspring, born to the convicts, grew up rugged children, forthright, laconic, even well-fed. Their soul was an outdoor soul. They were patriotic despisers of the British born, in a spacious land devoted entirely to penal institutions. They became used, contradictorily, to a vast practical freedom. In their birth and in the nature of the country itself lay the ultimate contradiction of the chains their parents had worn. In 1849, when the British tried to land convicts in Sydney, there was a great popular protest. A young politician called Henry Parks, the man who at the end of the century proposed transforming the Federation of the Australian States into the Commonwealth of Australia, made a series of resolutions that including the following assertion. It is incompatible with our existence as a free colony desiring self-government to be the receptacle of another country's felons. In fact, the last ship carrying British prisoners arrived in the colony of Western Australia in 1868. And that was it for transportation.
Sydney's early years were grim, with the colony nearly succumbing to starvation in 1790. In 1808, officers of the New South Corps deposed Governor Bly in what became known as the Rum Rebellion. But it was not until the arrival of Governor Lachlan Macquarie in 1810 that Sydney began the transformation into a colonial capital. Apart from some early structures of the rocks, many of Sydney's most historic buildings date from Macquarie's time, including the grand buildings on Macquarie Street. His construction program also included infrastructure, such as roads, bridges, wharves, all of which were erected using the convenient convict labour force. Australia's foundation story is more than the one voyage of Captain James Cook and the arrival of the First Fleet. It's a story about the seizure of land from the First Nations people, the denial of their indigenous sovereignty, the devastating frontier wars where they tried to just murder them, and separation from families and homelands. We live in the legacy of this history that has privileged some and disadvantaged many. Recognising and understanding this shared past is an important part and step towards our journey towards a better shared future. This can only be done if we discuss the nation's history truthfully and listen to First Nations voices which have been absent from Australia's foundation narratives and just recognising the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as traditional custodians of this city we call Sydney is a good place to start. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we all strive forward for us all. Welcome to Gadigal land. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We have survived. Oh.